Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today, uh, my friend uh, Philip and me are giving a talk about Angular Jazz, the bad parts. Um, first of all, um, we uh, first want to introduce ourselves. Um, I'm here with uh, Philip. Philip, um, you want to do in introduce yourself? No. No. <laughs> First, I have to apologize for my very bad English. I'm not a native speaker, so it might uh, appear that there are a couple of mistakes in our talk, but I hope that you guys will be fine with that. Um, okay, so my name is Filip Tarasiewicz, and I'm a pupil that's working in the web industry since 15 years, and I done everything that you can actually do on the web. And I've touched every programming language that you can actually touch on the web. Uh, so I basically have grown up with the web. As long as I can, I have started thinking as a human being, so uh, since that point I um, have done web development and have done stuff with the browser. For yeah, and finally, I've reached JavaScript and Go, and in particular, AngularJS as a JavaScript framework. And in that area, I'm working since four years, uh, four, four years as a consultant and coach. Yeah, yeah cool. Thanks. Um, for me, it's, it's quite similar. My English is also bad. <laughs> And uh, I hope it's okay for you, I think it's, it's okay. Uh, my background, um, about 10 years um, developing uh, web applications, uh, started with PHP, done a lot of Java crap, uh, and now I'm in uh, the Java, JavaScript um, developing. Um, and I'm also coaching since three years and uh, try to give more information uh, to, for, for other people to get started with the language. Um, I'm, uh, I've written um, today um, together with Philip um, a German book um, about the topic AngularJS. It's published by the um, D. -Punkt Verlag. It's a uh, German publisher. And um, uh, I think we're in Am Amazon uh, bestseller JavaScript book since, I don't know, six months. Six months. So there's a little, uh, little bit interest in AngularJS, and we were the lucky ones that uh, written the first book. So um, we're really, really proud of it, and it was a lot of fun, and uh, other... Very, very, very educational. Yeah, very educational, yeah. Um, and also, um, a friend of us, um, Sascha Brink, has written a book about um, AngularJS uh, recipes. Uh, recipes. It's about um, 70 problems and solutions um, you want to get in AngularJS. It's so everyday problems like copy-paste, things you can, you can use. Um, it's, it's free on LeanPub, and you can just uh, download it. Um, also, we, um, we're providing a uh, portal, AngularJSDE. Um, we're uh, writing German articles, blog posts. Uh, we're doing workshops, uh, external and in-house. And we have there also an open source book where you can contribute and uh, try to share the knowledge about Angular with us. Um, all the stuff we, we're doing, um, last year we founded a company, it's called uh, The Metix. Um, the Metix, uh, the, the core is um, we see the web as application platform. So the, the web browser is getting more and more like an um, operational system, uh, operating system, and you can really use it for all kind of application. Is it in, on the browser, on mobile, maybe uh, on em embedded devices, it's, it's really awesome. And uh, we're doing, doing a lot of stuff with it. Um, with JavaScript and the web. So, um, enough about us. Today we are here to talk about um, AngularJS. And um, first of, uh, of all, um, who of you have um, ever heard of AngularJS? Anything? Nice, okay. <laughs> um, who of you uh, is using it in the current project? Ah, okay, cool, so um, uh, a few. So, um, Angular uh, in a nutshell uh, for, for the first. We have um, many concepts that are really, um, with that these are the, the core concepts of, of Angular. Um, it's just 12 points or something. And um, it's really, really cool. And I think um, the most of you people are really um, think it's really, really nice to create uh, applications with, uh, with Angular. And for us, it's the same. We, we really love Angular. It's really, really cool. The first time it is um, like 
after years with jQuery, jQuery is really nice, but it's too, too less structure. You have a layer where there's more structure and you, can, you, are, you are forced to, to use um, um, concepts that, um, standard, uh, that, that kind of standard. And um, when you look at Google Trends or something, many people are using Angular and it's kind of um, the, the most popular framework uh, in, in the moment and it's really, really good to get um, uh, help, response um, and developers. So um, we're doing project uh, for three years now. We're doing full-time development and consulting um, with teams from two up to 50 people with uh, different layers of, of teams. Um, and there are also many big, uh, big companies, big players in Germany, uh, concerns, concerne. <laughs> Um, so the really big players are using Angular, and it's, for us it's really, really crazy because it's a JavaScript framework, and everybody's using it, uh, even this uh, passive uh, concerns. And um, when we're doing consulting, there's a um, lot of people uh, doing many, many things wrong in the framework because the, the framework gives some, gives some um, directions you have to do, um, how to use uh, scopes, controllers, and other things, and people doing it wrong or to invert the question, maybe the framework is doing wrong. And that's uh, the main part of the, um, of the talk today. We, um, we want to reflect some uh, strange behavior of the framework, what is good, what is not good, and maybe um, is there any solution, any, any other way we can do. So at first, um, we have um, a bunch of examples we want to, uh, to, to show you. Um, the first half, um, I will be uh, talking about, and the second will be Phil's part. Um, first, I will start um, with this tough uh, start for beginners, and with this picture again. And um, who of you understand every word in the context of AngularJS of this? One, two, okay. And uh, when you looked first time at AngularJS, what was the first first thing where, where you heard um, dependency injection, routing, expressions, modules? For me and many other users, they are starting with the framework. It's like, what? There's so many new wordings, and uh, what what can I do with this uh, whole bunch of words? Um, and it's um, the, the the strangest part is. You know this um, provider factory service uh, delegation. What what means in in fact, it's all these concepts creating one provider. It's a, it's a provider for the uh, dependency injection. And uh, there are so many different words and abstraction layers for this. And it's really, really strange for new one, uh, for new people coming in it. And it's uh, always like, I want to do a service, but uh, that's instantiated with, with new. What's going on here? But um, the best thing is, do you know the, um, the term controller? And every time you go into the uh, Angular framework controller, it's like, ah, I know, MVC. Yeah, I have a controller. I have to blow them up like, like the biggest I have ever seen. So they're putting all the stuff in controllers. And um, we do a lot of consulting. And <laughs> our, uh, our daily, um, daily consulting job is like, no, no, it's not MVC. It's really not MVC. You, the, the controller is not really a uh, controller like you're using in, in any other MVC framework. The pattern you're using is uh, model view, view model. That's a totally different, different, uh, different layer. And uh, many, many people don't see this. So the framework is not communicating this, this pattern right, or it's, it's, it's not the naming of controller is, is not the best. Because you have this view, this view layer, this uh, actual instance of, the, of your HTML template where you can interact with, uh, with the browser and you have a two-way data binding to the view model called scope and you have this model part. And the model part in AngularJS is also, it's not really defined. So you have kinds of like service and, uh, and, and such thing where you can really uh, define your model, but in the documentation it's not clearly defined. So it's always like uh, you have to learn it by doing and it's not really clear at, at the start. Um, also, controller is a good concept because controller defining um, real scopes um, based on um, HTML components. So you can define scope on a subtree of, of a DOM, um, and um, it's it's really good. It's nice, but the name is a bad choice. When we going into the um, consulting and try, trying to, to train some people with AngularJS, we are always using the the uh, term scope constructor um, constructor because that's that's more meaningful for for a controller to handle it right. Because when you when you handle it like a controller, like an MVC, you're doing it wrong. 
even um, analysis is later, yeah? It's later with, with the miscodings. Okay, cool. That's, that's the first start. Um, the name controller in Angular is really, really bad choice. That's, that's because, I don't know if you mentioned, um, I, um, I, I named the pattern M uh, model view view model, like, like the first part there on the, on the slides, but there's a second MV, uh, Y, and this is because the um, pattern f changed in development. It's like a historical grow, uh, growing of the framework, and so we call it often model view whatever, because it's not really clear what is the real design pattern. So um, that's the first part. Um, uh, that's the first part. Second, modules. Who of you using modules in AngularJS? Nice, really good. Um, and you know, the module is like um, you have this global uh, variable Angular, and you can call Angular module, can give the module a name, and a bunch of dependencies. So you can, um, um, after you, you edit this, this um, you, you initialize this model, you can add um, a, some concepts, some uh, components to the, to the app. Where the second syntax, um, uh, second call of the module function is without this array. And you're adding some components, and then suddenly uh, someone uh, is coding, coding, and adding some more con uh, more components. And you, uh, someone did this second of this this little um, this little ar um, erasing here. And what happens at this time? Angular is reinitializing the module. So all components that you have designed, that have, you have uh, written until this point. Uh, getting completely cleared, and you have a really fresh module, and you only have the last controller in it. Um, that's okay sometimes, but the, the bad thing is, Angular isn't throwing an exception or a warning, or you don't ever notice if that happened. And if someone um, third-party code comes into your application and maybe reinitialize with the, with the same name, your com complete module is complete clear. That's really bad, and they should fix it. But I don't know. That's a really, really bad. Um, bad uh, architecture of Angular. Mm. Other point is, lazy loading of modules is not, is not possible. Um, have you ever tried to, um, to create lazy loading with, with, with AngularJS? Someone with CommonJS and things? So for me, it's always a nasty hack, because it's not, um, it's not possible to, to really, uh, with the native Angular, to load modules asynchronously um, after, initial, uh, after bootstrapping the whole Angular. So that's, a, that's the main part I don't, I don't really like here. So now it's um, time for the services, and um, I uh, talked enough for you, and now uh, the Philip will uh, talk to you with the rest of the bad parts. All right, so let me introduce you to some more flaws that are actually built in into AngularJS. I hope you guys that don't really know AngularJS uh, have a little of an idea what we're talking about here, but it's kind of really uh, in-depth um, yeah, picture of AngularJS and the problems that are really built in currently. So let us continue with services. Uh, basically, services are nice from an architectural perspective. You can do a lot of stuff with services, but there is one thing that is actually very, very, very bad in, in AngularJS, and the point is that you cannot really um, define two equally named services. So it really isn't possible to do this, and it kind of is really a problem because you cannot load two modules, for example, like in this um, example here. For example, you have um, two modules, one is called foo module and another one is called my app module and you've got this data service in your foo module and you've got another data service in your my app module and um, your my app module depends on the uh, on the foo module and basically then in the my app module you're trying to write a controller like in the last line of code here and you want to inject this data service so what is happening which data service gets injected? So you got your Angular, the Angular JS developers here. You, you, I think you should know. So, which data service gets injected? Huh? Should be the first one. Is is your why?
Yeah, but it's actually it's the, the second one. Yeah, because uh, the last one, the last write uh, right call to to the to the Angular API wins, and so the last uh, data service that is known to the framework is the second data service that is defined in the my app module, and so you've got a problem because. Um, you, maybe you want to use third-party modules in your app, and this is what everybody does on a daily basis, I think. So um, it's actually not, not possible, or it might be connected with, with a lot of problems because, because it may appear that your own services uh, are equally named like, like the services in the third-party library. So you've got a problem because Maybe you cannot use your own services, or maybe you cannot use the services from the third-party library. And this clash might be a real problem in your application. So this is really something that hopefully Angular will change in a new version, maybe in Angular 2.0, when everything changes. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit more about services. The next point is services are singletons, and it's this is actually something that might be this what you want to have, because when multiple controllers want to inject a service, so it really is the case that you want to have the same instance. Yeah? But there is also the situation that you want to have a fresh object. For example, when there are services that maintain state, because in, um, the, the idea behind a singleton is that um, when you've got state in a single, it's global application state, and that's kind of a hell for testing. You cannot test components, or you cannot, cannot test services that have global application state, because you just cannot mock, mock them up in a way. Uh, there are a lot of components that, that can change the global application state, and so it's very, very hard to deal with these components uh, when you write unit tests. So. When we want to write real testable applications, this is kind of a design flaw. There should be a flag or possibility in AngularJS to um, tell the framework that you, that you want to have a fresh instance every time that you inject a service in a controller, for example. All right, so next point is conventions. So I, hope, I think uh, I've seen about 30 or 40 people that are um, using AngularJS currently in a project. I think when you guys would start to, to sum up your structures and your conventions um, and your projects, um, in the end we would get here 40 different conventions. This is what I, I see on a daily basis when I'm working with the customers. So basically, there is no real convention how to name modules. So there are, there are third-party modules. There are built-in modules. There are modules that they are called with the ng prefix. There are modules that are, um, that are named with the ng prefix, but there is, a, there is a dash in it. There are modules that are, that are named with a, with a dot in it. And there is no, um, actually there's no, no registry where you can tell other people about, oh, I'm using the prefix blah, 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 or foo. So basically, um, there are a lot of situations in your daily life where things that, that you build using modules, that you, that you define uh, your own modules, and they are clashing with other modules because there is no real convention how to name them. So everybody has, has to find his own convention, and every time we are working with a customer, we have to think about a convention that uh, is meaningful to the customer and that cannot clash with third-party libraries that you can download or with the built-in uh, uh, modules that you can um, load into your AngularJS application. So let's talk about file naming. That's the same problem, actually. Uh, when we talk about file naming, there are developers or develop, development teams that call controllers, for example, um, feature controllers, like, like here, that you, you've got a, the whole word um, at the end. And there are people that just write the CTRL, and there are people that, 
have a directory, maybe controllers, and they, they just um, leave out the word controller or CDRL and the file. So when we've got tests, for example, there are people that are calling their tests specs, that there are people that are calling their test test, and so on. So it's every time when you, when you get a new, um, a new code basis from a customer in order to do a code review, for example, it's really hard to, to grasp what the project, project is all about. You have to really look into the files and you have to check uh, which components are defined and you have to check how many components are defined in one file. So it's kind of hard work for, for consultants and for, for the new developers to um, look into a new code base and to, to find a structure and have, have, a, have a good understanding of the code that, that you're seeing in your IDE. Yeah, and then the next next part is directory structures. It's just the same. So when you when you've got a big AngularJS application, you basically have to write multiple modules. You cannot do everything in one module. So the next, so, so you have to think about how how can I structure my, my modules? Do I have to write um, a new directory for every module? Do I have to separately? Uh, version my, my modules uh, using Bower, for example, or using NPM or whatever. So there is no real convention how to do it, and everybody has his own way to do it. And this is something that is, that is really, really hard to do. So maybe a framework that really tries to be um, an application framework like Angular for, for the enterprise world, because there are a lot of companies from, from the enterprise sector that really use it, and Google knows that, that there are a lot of people from the enterprise world that really use it. You have to provide some more structure and some more ideas into, into structural components um, in order to allow the developers from, from an enterprise to really build projects that can be maintained in a, in a nice way. Yeah, here are a couple of more examples from projects that we see on a daily basis. Okay, so the problem that we don't have any conventions um, is a real problem, uh, but there are, there are some solutions in order to cope with the problem. For example, there is a new routing mechanism that is about to be developed and will be part of Angular.0 and will be part of Angular uh, 1.4. It will be backported to Angular 1.4. And this is a first step in the right direction because it uh, really tries to uh, give the developers basic structural information and it gives you an idea how you should structure your, your code and how you, you should put, put in your routes and what you should, should put in your files. So there is some more guidelines behind this routing mechanism that's really something that would be quite cool if we had it two years ago. So, uh, yeah, and there are, there are a couple of style guides that you can find on the Internet. For example, um, John Papa, there is a really famous uh, AngularJS developer from, from the United States. He's called John Papa, and there is another one. Um, he's called uh, Todd Motto. When you, when you look, at, look them up on the internet or when you click on this link, you can find two style guides. And these style guides are actually quite good in order, in order to deal with, with these problems that I've talked about uh, a couple of minutes ago. And yeah, they, they try to cope with that, but actually there are not that many persons that really use style guides. So there is, maybe there is a there are teams that are starting with a, with, with a style guide, but then when time gets rough, when uh, use cases have to be finished in a very short um, time, then style guides are, yeah, they are just thrown away. <laughs> this, is my, this is my experience. It's like test cases. <laughs> okay, let's talk about scopes. That's the next thing. Um, there is one nice feature in Angular that is called two-way data binding. And it's actually a cool feature that allows you uh, to, to write a lot of, a lot of nice um, data-driven code without doing all this nasty glue code uh, that, that you have to 
uh, write, for example, when you're doing stuff with jQuery, you don't have to uh, register all these event handlers, you don't have to update your model in your, um, in your code. This is something that the framework should actually do for you. But it doesn't come for free, so there, there must be an algorithm that really, um, yeah, this, that really implements all, all the logic that is needed in order to make this uh, synchronization happen. And this is, in AngularJS, this is called dirty checking. And it's actually a very, very uh, neat um, piece of code, but there is also a problem. Because this is the performance issue that you've got in your application, because dirty checking is a real limitation. Every time when there is a situation in, in your application where something might have changed, Angular has to, has, to, um, has to execute the dirty checking and has to check all the scopes, whether there is a difference between your scope and the data in your view, and has to do the sync. And this is not free. So this is a quite hard algorithm that has to be executed. And this might become a real performance issue. And it's not something that only, um, that only can be uh, seen in very, very big applications. You can see, you can, you can construct um, cases where you've got real problems with a couple lines of code. So this is a real problem in AngularJS by now. And this is actually the limit of AngularJS. So when you've got um, applications that have to do a lot of updates in, your view, in, in one view, and they've, they've got a big state, for example, and this, this state is um, updated all the time. For example, like, like the guy that, that has introduced the, the Go, Go um, versus Go, yeah. This, this kind of applications where you've got a big dashboard with a lot of charts and a lot of data, and you've got maybe in a chart like 20,000 points, and all this, all this data is two-way data bound, and you've got maybe uh, 20 or 40 of these, of these charts, and you've got uh, more data on, on the left-hand side, and maybe you've got a navigation bar or whatever that is kind of, uh, that needs to display um, uh, some, some numbers that are executed on the fly when, when data changes, for example. This is something that is really hard to accomplish with AngularJS. It's not possible. You can, you can optimize all, all these algorithms and all the structures, but it really, really can be um, very hard to do this. And you actually, when you're trying to do this, then you're actually fighting against the problem of the framework, and not, not against the problem that you really have. So, so when you really want to write um, these applications that have a big state and this state changes uh, very frequently, then you should really think about whether you use AngularJS or whether you use another framework, maybe where you've got more control over the data binding mechanisms. Okay, do you guys know the dot problem? Who knows the dot problem? Of the, Angular, of the AngularJS developers. And this is something that is kind of strange. I mean, when you look into, into the AngularJS code, then you can really understand why there is the dot problem. But when you're new to AngularJS, and when, you're first, um, ha you, when, you, when you have to deal with a scope, scope hierarchy, when you have to access data that is defined in your parent scope, so it's sometimes a little bit weird when the dot problem um, becomes your problem, okay? So the basic, um, the basic idea behind the dot problem is when you, when you want to access data uh, from a child scope that is defined on the parent scope, then you really have to uh, think about it, how to do it in the right way. So let's talk about an example. For example, here, um, the people that know AngularJS can, I think, probably know what is happening here. It's just a bunch of HTML. And basically, we've got two controllers. We've got a parent controller, and then we've got an embedded uh, child controller. And we've got um, two um, scope variables. What, we've got the foo scope variable, and then we've got the bar bus scope variable. And when you think about it, bar bus should be a, an object because there's a dot, dot in it. And then when we look what happens, when we've got this code and we execute it. So basically, let's, this is a GIF. 
So let's look at it from the beginning. This is the beginning. Huh? It's pronounced Jeff. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I told you, sorry for my bad English. <laughs> so basically what is happening here? We've got this foo variable um, on the left-hand side, and we've got the parent controller and we've got the child controller, and we want some kind of connection between these two controllers, and everybody who knows AngularJS knows that you can... Um, that there is something that is called scope inheritance. That means you can access data from a, um, from a child's scope that is defined on the parent scope. So here, um, we try to access data in the child scope that is defined on the parent scope, and we, first we, we want to access the foo variable, and then we want to access the bar bus variable. And you can, you can see that there is a, there is a difference between the, the access um, between the foo variable and the bar bus variable. And yeah, the, the, the problem here is that when you've got, when you, when you deal with, with an object, then it's possible to do it in a way that you, as a developer, would assume how it works. And when you're using with, uh, simple data types, like a, like a number or like a string, for example, like here, so this kind of be can become weird. Everybody knows JavaScript, so this is actually the root of this of this problem is in the in the JavaScript implementation and in and how um, then the, the prototype prototype inheritance works, but it really is kind of weird in applications and you can have a lot of problems with with this uh, dot problem in in applications. So this is Misco. Um, Misco is a He's a core developer of AngularJS, and his um, quotation was, if you use ng-model, there has to be a dot somewhere. And if you don't have a dot, you're doing it wrong. Okay, So this kind of feels a little bit weird, at least for me. It's a word. <laughs> and then there are isolated scopes. I think. Every AngularJS developer knows isolated scopes. And isolated scopes are really isolated in the concept how the framework is, is built and um, how they uh, have, really think, uh, have really thought about uh, the concept. But um, the state that you can access on the scopes can um, give the developer all the opportunities to change behavior. So when you've got an isolated scope, and usually a, a, an isolated scope, so the, the meaning behind an isolated scope is that you cannot access the data from a parent scope. So this is basically what you want to achieve with an, with an isolated scope. But you can use this scope uh, dot. Hello? Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> Should we switch the batteries or? Okay, so let's just go on. So basically, you can access um, you can access the data from from the parent scope even. Let's go. So you you can access uh, the data from from the parent scope even if you use isolated scope. So. Um, there are a lot of developers in AngularJS that use the internal state of, of the scope, like all these dollar dollar variables and dollar var variables to do really nasty stuff with with AngularJS. So um, they write code that really is not maintainable, that is not testable because they use the state of Angular that AngularJS you use inter in internally in order to provide you all the magic that you have on a daily basis and that you have in the framework. And this is something that is really, really, uh, really hard to grasp sometimes when you look into third-party libraries because um, then you, you've, got a, you've got a third party library and you, and you think about how did they do that because it's actually not possible. And then you see this library and, they, and, you, and you see and you realize that, you have, that they've done a lot of nasty stuff with, 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 the, with the internal state that you, and that, that you actually cannot use it in that way because there will be a version of AngularJS in the future that will break this. So this is something that you should look into. 
Yeah, I try to. Okay, next point is templates. Um, I think the templating mechanism in AngularJS is quite nice, actually, um, because there is a separation of concerns that you've got... Uh, that, you, that you've got a piece of HTML and you've got a controller and there is a relation between the controller and, and, and the piece of HTML, the template. But the problem is that you've got directives and you've got a lot of built-in directives and it's actually not a problem because it's nice that you've got a directive, it's a nice feature. But there are a lot of developers that use uh, specific built-in AngularJS directives in order to split the logic that they write between the template and, and the controller. For example, uh, code that I see once in a month uh, when I look into code bases from customers, I see uh, initialized variables that are initialized with an ng in it, in a template, and then these variables are used in a controller. So this kind of is very, very, very weird, and you really have to think about why something like this happens. So there are sometimes variables in a controller that actually cannot exist. And then you, think of, and then you start to think about uh, how does someone, or what was the, 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 the initial idea of, of this code? And then you look into the template and then you realize, ah, okay, so there's a ng init statement, and, or there is an ng init directive, and, and the developer uh, has initialized the variables in the template, and afterwards uh, he uses the, the variables in the controller. So um, this possibility that you've got specific um, directives that allow, that allow you to do really nasty stuff with them is kind of something that should be done a little better in a, in a further version of AngularJS, in my opinion. Okay, so let's talk about um, the real cool feature of AngularJS directives. I think when we talk about AngularJS, everybody wants to talk about directives because this is real, the feature that um, has made AngularJS very popular uh, besides the fact that, that there is two-way data binding and that you have di uh, dependency injection and stuff like that. But direct directives are really, really nice, actually. And um, when we think about all the stuff that has happened since directive has been uh, introduced, stuff like web components uh, and so on, then we can really see that the, 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 the initial idea be behind directives was very, very neat. But the problem is actually that directives are very complex. You can write complete books only about directives. You can hold uh, one-week workshops only concerning directives. Uh, there is a lot of to learn when you, when you want to write real cool directives. Thank you very much. There is transclusion. There is this weird naming pattern that you, for example, you name a directive color and then camel case picker and then you get a you get a HTML tag when you want to have a HTML tag that is called color and uh, dash picker and you, and you just thinking why is this pattern pattern like this can it, the pattern be in a way that is uh, some kind of more uh, more and understandable to the developer and you have to learn a lot of rules and a lot of conventions and a lot of stuff that has been um, has been built into into directives in order to make them really work in your specific use case. So directives are cool, but you really have to uh, spend a lot of time on directives uh, in order to grasp the concept and to really use them in the way that is uh, idiomatic to, to, to AngularJS. So there is a this is a real, a real, real in-depth um, situation from, from, from AngularJS. There is, there is this processing cycle, how, how directives or how multiple directives are processed by AngularJS. And you see that this might be very, very complicated. I just, I just don't want to explain this in detail because I think there are a lot of people here that even don't know how AngularJS works. So, but in order to understand this, and it might become uh, even complicated when you've got, for example, uh, an own built DSL 
uh, the domain specific language that's built on top of directives, then you have to think about controllers, then you have to think about the relation between controllers, you have to think about pre-compile functions, uh, pre-link functions, compile functions, post-link functions. And there is a lot of stuff to learn in order to make the things happen that you really want to make happen with AngularJS. So this is something that is a little bit strange because when you think about the problems that di directors really solve, um, and, you are, uh, and, you, and you know uh, how JavaScript works and how the stuff might have been built, then you realize that there could have been a, a much better solution to provide the same feature. Okay, this is another one that I really like. Um, when you've got kind of errors in your scope bindings, so this is something that AngularJS does, is very forgiving when you've got errors. So you can do a lot of errors in your code and AngularJS just says, oh, it's everything fine, I can, I can work with that. And I think that's kind of a real, real bad decision because when you're building real applications that you then you want to see the error as soon as possible and you don't because sometimes you you've got an error at the beginning but you just don't see see the error and then you're building more code and more code and more code and then, then you're solving the next user story and so on and then you think it's actually ready but done there is a bug and you don't have a test case and it's really hard to find bugs um, in such a code base when you've got errors and an application framework or, or platform is very forgiving when it comes to errors. Whoa, 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 whoa. Better? Okay. Okay, the next point is dependency injection and minification. Um, actually, dependency injection is a really nice concept in AngularJS because it allows you to write code that is testable because in a test case, <laughs> do, do you want to hold it for me, maybe? <laughs> okay. Um, actually, it's a really nice concept because dependency injection allows you to write testable code. Because in a unit test, for example, you can uh, mock a dependency, you can, you can exchange a, a dependency by a mock object, and so you can uh, create a situation and a context for, for, for unit tests that uh, allows you to control all the all the variables and all the parameters that are um, important for your, for your test case. And this is quite nice because when you, um, when you don't have dependency injection, you have to, you have to uh, fix um, all, all the dependencies um, in your code and you have to, uh, it's very hard to exchange them by, um, by mock objects, for example. And everybody actually who's using AngularJS knows how, how dependency injection works in AngularJS it's based on the named function parameters. So for example, in your controller, you've got your named function parameters and AngularJS tries to, to read these names, uh, these named fun uh, function parameters because you can, you can um, execute the two string function of your controllers because it's JavaScript and every function is an object. So you can, you can call uh, two string and then you get the string representation of your controller code. So this is what Ang AngularJS is doing. But the problem is, um, HTTP 2.0 is not reality. Not, not until now. We have to wait a couple of months, maybe a couple, couple of years, maybe one or two, until all, all the browsers and all the, the web servers uh, will support it and all the people uh, in the web world will, will, will adapt it. So, we, need, we, we still need to do stuff like minification, like con concatenation, like uglify. So all these hacks need to be done in order to uh, make our applications a little bit more performant in order to, um, to reduce uh, the overhead of, of, JavaScript of J JavaScript code, of CSS, and so on, and of templates, for example. So by now, there is something like minification and like uh, concatenation and like uh, uglify and you, you, you need to do it. Yeah, and when you've got dependency injection and it's based on named function parameters and then you use, for example, uglify, then you've got a problem. 
because uh, the ugly fire is changing the names of your named parameters because it tries to make them very, very short. And then your dependency injection mechanism breaks. So this is something that is quite bad in AngularJS. So there are workarounds like 10 minutes. Oh my god. I've, still, I've got still about 100 slides. <laughs> was a joke, right? A joke. Okay. Okay. So, um, what is the workaround actually? You've got um, the array syntax. You can define your dependency with an array, and you've got these dollar inject syntax. So, there are kind of, this, this is kind of a workaround. So, they, the guys at AngularJS have realized, okay, oh my God, we've got a problem when it comes to minification, and they've provided you a syntax, uh, an alternative syntax for providing dependencies in order to make this happen for you. And of course, you, cannot, you, have, you don't have to do it by your own. Um, there, is, there are a lot of um, gulp tasks, and grunt tasks that you can use in order to accomplish that, for example, ng annotate. So this is kind of solved, but it's also something that should be built into the framework. I don't want to use another gulp task in order to make it happen. I don't want to use, it, to use another tool to make it happen. I just want to use a framework, actually. So this is something that should be built into the framework, in my opinion, when there will be a next version of Angular. OK, server-side rendering is something that is, that is uh, kind of FIP in the last months. That, um, yeah. In single page applications, you've got something like uh, server side rendered views or server side uh, rendered templates that um, a server can send to the client, and the client uh, doesn't need to do anything, just to just have to put it into the DOM and they are ready. Um, this is also sometimes uh, necessary for, um, for CEO because CEO, um, it kind of can execute, there is a specification that. Um, that there are bots that can execute your JavaScript code and can crawl your um, single page application. But until today, do you have used it? It's not that easy. So you still need, uh, for example, software as a service uh, uh, vendors like pre render, or you have to do crazy stuff with PhantomJS uh, in order to, yeah, to make server side rendering happen. So this is also something that should be built into the framework in some of the, of the further versions. OK, authentication and authorization. So this is a general problem of single page applications. Uh, authentication is actually kind of solved. We've got uh, JWT, so JSON Web Token. So this is kind of solved. But what about authorization? This is a topic that is solved on the server side since many years. We've got Rails CanCan, we've got uh, several Java frameworks, we've got um, role-based authentication on the server. So basically, this is actually solved, but in single page apps, it can be very, very hard to do this. So for example, in Angular, we've got Angular permissions, but it only works when you've got, uh, when you've got a routing me mechanism in your application. But there are a lot of customer, uh, customer projects that I've seen, they, they, they don't even know what routing is. They, they don't even know what a, what a uh, URL is. So it's, it can be quite a big challenge to, um, to write code in order to make authorization happen in your application. So this is also something, in my opinion, that, that a real application framework should uh, yeah, give you out of the box. So what is the, what is the conclusion? The conclusion is actually um, Angular is not perfect. And it's clear that it cannot be perfect because it wasn't engineered to be perfect, actually. But um, by now, in our opinion, it's still the most appro appropriate JS or the JavaScript framework for typ typical enterprise applications. And you really can build nice applications with, with Angular, but the problem is when you've got specific use cases like you want to have um, a lot of control over the rendering mechanism of your application, for example, or you have to deal with a lot of real-time data, or you have to deal with, with a lot of updates, or when you have to deal with a lot of data, that 
must be visible to the user, then you have to think about another framework because with AngularJS, it might become very, very hard. Um, I don't say that it, that it is not a, impossible because there, are, uh, there is for every problem in AngularJS, there is a workaround, but um, let's be honest, we don't want to find the framework, we want to find our own problems. So sometimes there are situations where you really so should think about, should I really use AngularJS? And even we, on, in, our, in our own projects, in our own products, uh, there are situations where we don't use AngularJS, although we know a lot about AngularJS because we just don't want to fight the problems of the framework. So deal with it. <laughs> yeah, and all the haters still gonna hate, so this is a problem that we always have with all the JavaScript frameworks out there, so there is no one that really, um, everybody thinks that uh, he, has, he has the best framework and he's invented the best framework and it, it's the hammer for, for every nail. Okay, so I hope that this talk wasn't too technical um, and not too deeply uh, covering AngularJS. I hope that everybody um, has the possibility to follow um, this, this topic and the points that we've mentioned. Um, yeah, so are there still any questions? Yeah? Where is my drink? Thanks for the great talk. What's your opinion on Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Bela. Um, yeah, it kind of is, and I think that you've seen the the keynote of Google on on NG Europe in last October. I think, in my opinion, it was kind of a de of, of, um, kind of a disaster uh, because um, when you're Google and when you're actually somebody that knows how to communicate uh, uh, breaking changes to your, to your early adopters and to your users, then you cannot go uh, on the stage and just tell everybody um, this and this and this to what we've built uh, in the last uh, four years and that you've built your applications on is just shit and just throw it away huh? because this doesn't work or it, it doesn't work in, in the enterprise world. Where, my or where our customers live. Um, so this was kind of weird. Um, but I actually, yes, I think that many problems that I, I've discussed today, or that we've discussed today, will be, sol will be solved with AngularJS 2.0. Uh, and, and the next nice thing is that Angular tries to be, <coughs> tries to, uh, tries to uh, use um, functionality that is already there. So we don't, uh, reinvent directives. We just use web components. We don't reinvent uh, stuff like, um, don't know, maybe services or modules because they are already built in, in ECMAScript 6, for example. So we don't have to recreate modules because we, the new JavaScript uh, version has a lot of nice things that can be used in a new version of AngularJS in order to make it a little bit better. Yeah, and Google has also, I think you've, you've heard about AdScript, and there is also, we've got Christian here. Uh, I've heard that Google uh, will uh, cooperate with Microsoft. Uh, by in, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, the, the, the AdScript team will co cooperate with the TypeScript team in order to, uh, to create a basis for ECMAScript 7. And this is some, uh, there is a lot of stuff that will happen and that will make... Uh, the, the way that we, we're we creating single page applications really interesting and will change a lot of, um, yeah, a, a lot of ways how we create uh, our applications today. And of course, a lot of flaws that uh, I've uh, introduced today or we, we've discussed uh, about, or we've, we've discussed today will be solved. And um, there will be new concepts 
that will allow you to do your stuff in a completely new way. So you will have to start to think about them in another way. So I think many of uh, these problems just will be solved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.